Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this uh, very unusual session. It is about security, but more uh, about you as a security professional. And um, I get uh, a lot of questions uh, sometimes, like, oh, how's it? you can travel the world, and you know, you seem to have so many contacts and all this. Some people think everything sort of comes on a silver platter or something like you don't have to do anything for it, and that some people are born in a more lucky position than others. Um, I've learned along the way that that's possibly not the case, and especially everything is relative, right? So uh, it's all about what you do with the things that are given to you or that are uh, coming to your way and that challenge you. And I've had my own share of challenge, uh, and I've managed to do something with it. Uh, I don't know if it's any good or bad, but it's just my thing. It's, it's me. And I think that's what this session is really trying to hone into and to, to get into is if you're really clear on who you want to be, who you are as a person, what you want to bring to the world, and also how you want to translate that into your work, people will feel it, and they will come to you. And every person is having a unique combination of uh, skills, of values, of characteristics that nobody in this room has, and that alone should tell you something. Yeah, if you know what it is and you really want to use it, it's there for you. Everyone was born, born with a unique set. So. That's what this session is uh, going to be all about. So um, there's uh, a couple of slides that I have, uh, and they're also going to be shared, as, uh, as far as I know, after the conference. And, uh, and those on, uh, online, yeah, please take notes, just like we're doing here in this uh, live room here in Paris. Um, what I'd like to, to start with is um, actually looking at uh, apart from your own background, you, know, you can see all my stuff up there, you know, my things that I've studied, the ISO standards, and all of these things. Um, there's your skills, and that's one thing in the toolkit. You know, your personality is another thing in the toolkit. Uh, your gender, your background, your language set, they're all skills in your toolkit. And if you only focus on the skills and the certifications, you might be missing out on the rest of the opportunity. And so don't think that things are uh, in the way. See how they are on your way and how you can utilize them. So that's what this session is all about. Um, next slide, please. Um, there's a few slides here. You can see this one and also the next one. How you see that I have tried to uh, not be different in my work as a person than I am in life. And that's really, really important. I see quite a lot of people who really put on some sort of um, professional cloak or something they call it when they go to work and they transform themselves into some personality and when they come home, they, oh, they can finally relax. And then they need a holiday, you know, to get out of being that fake person or whatever. And um, it's possibly society that's driven that in people. Um, but I'm challenging you and to go, am I doing that? Is that what's happening for me? Because I think for me personally, that's one of the very unsustainable things. And that's where I start feeling very unhealthy, you know, when I have to be someone that I really am not. So that's, I guess, the, the first uh, little lesson here. And they were, by the way, two of my elderly family members from Holland jumping around with the Maasai in Africa. And I combined my travels for work with pleasure. And sometimes people find that weird or whatever. And I introduce people to my business contacts sometimes if it feels right, you know? And it's all about, you know, tuning into, okay, does this feel like the situation is okay or not? There's not that many rules in the world, I've noticed. If you do it in the right context, you can get away with a lot, of, lot more things. And if you do it with a smile and with really being you, you can get away with even more. So that's the, the idea here. So where do you see yourself in three to five years? Can you please, there's some notepads, I think, around in the, the physical conference. Uh, if you're at home, yeah, you can maybe grab a pen and a piece of paper. I challenge you to, uh, for the next two minutes, write down, a, write a picture, draw a picture, or write down a couple of bullet points on where you see yourself in three to five years. Now, you can maybe look um, vocationally where you see yourself, where you see yourself physically living, where you see your family going with that. Um, who do you want to be as a professional? What, what sort of people you want to work with? Any of those sorts of things. So please take a couple of minutes... Close your eyes and look at the next three to five years. Where do you see yourself as a person? And maybe this is the first time you thought about that in a while. <coughs> that tells you something too, right? So just have a little sense into that and feel in what do you see yourself to be doing. 
And this is all about your values, right? And, and if you think about, and this is what I ask every person that ever comes to work with me, I don't ask them, where's your certifications? Where's your PCB list? Where are your ISO certificates? I ask them, what gets you out of bed in the morning without external motivation? Stupid question, right? It's not a stupid question. If that person says, look, really, I want to take my dog for a walk and I want to be at my daughter's school at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and that's my joy of my day, I, as, as their employer, I'm not going to design a job for them that gets them not into that mode at 3 o'clock, that keeps them out of the home for 3, three o'clock, and that gets them not to walk their dog. Because eventually, they're going to choose what's in it for me. They're going to choose what really what really inspires them. Yeah, so think about that for starters. What gets you up naturally in the morning that actually nobody has to set the alarm for? Like, you, nobody has to kick you out of bed for that. If it's something, whatever it is in your personal life, in your professional life, start translating that into how can you do more of that and be handsomely paid for it. Not a weird question, right? But see how it fits with what you really want to be doing. Because if that's what you can be doing the rest of your life, it's going to come natural. Yeah, and you're going to be healthy physically and mentally and emotionally doing it, I think. All right, so hopefully you, wrote, you guys wrote down some, uh, some interesting notes there. Can we uh, get uh, the next slide? All right, so the first, um, I guess, tip number one, I guess uh, I, could, I could call it, is understand your own values and uh, really your own priorities, what is important to you and your goals, and set your goals accordingly. If you set your goal, like I've done this before, right? When I was young, when I was young, I set goals like, I want to go to the gym four times a week for 45 minutes, blah, 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 blah. As soon as I started writing it down, I actually already knew I was not going to actually be able to do it <laughs> because I just don't like doing it, you know? And so how far can you push something uphill? Not very far. So um, that's the reason for this, uh, for this slide or this little exercise. So your first little exercise is the top seven shoulds and the top seven actual pastimes. So please write down quickly, whether it's on a digital thing or whether it's on a paper, write down the top seven things that you tell yourself should. For me, that was I should be doing more exercise. I should be seeing my family more. I should call them more. I haven't talked to my mother too enough. I should call her more. I should be doing this and that and the other. I should be saving more money. I should be... Write those things down, please. This is for you personally. Nobody's going to ask you about any of this after this exercise, okay? What are your seven shoulds? And then I'd like you to write down your top seven or five. Your actual, what you think you spend most of your time on. If you look at your awake hours, you go, actually, I do spend a lot of time on this. I should be doing exercise, but I am spending time on Netflix, that kind of stuff. So please write down those seven things that you actually see yourself spending a lot of time on. Once again, this is just for you. You can be purely, basically honest. <laughs> All right. Okay, next. A quick exercise number two, that is a one-liner about your past 12 months. If I asked you right now, and I said, how were you last 12 months? And you have to answer in two sentences. I don't care if it's personal, professional, or whatever. Write down, how were you last 12 months? And then, I'm going to ask you, it's today, the 5th of October, 2024. What are you going to answer? What's a realistic but nice answer that you'd like to give me on the 24th, 2024 date of today? So 5th of October, 2024. What would you like to say if I said, how was your last 12 months? Now, I'm not talking about winning the lottery and stuff that is kind of unachievable to the most average humans, right? I'm talking about stuff that's achievable, but that is a little stretch level. 
where you go, actually, this would be really cool if I could say this. It's doable, it's not easy. But you see that little line at the bottom, no pain, no gain, right? Doesn't have to be easy. You see, I'm rolling quite quickly through this exercise, but this is something you can redo, of course, when you have more time. But I'd like you to still make a start today, right? All right, now, one little tip. Where you actually see those top seven shoots, who has at least three or four differences with the second bullet point, which is what you actually spend time on? Who has at least three or four differences there? Who says, I should be doing this, but I sort of should be doing that. I am actually doing that. Who has quite a few differences there? Yeah, quite a few of you have differences there. I can already tell you the shoulds and the what you spend time on ideally are exactly the same list. Because why do you otherwise spend time on those things? Because you should. Because you actually, they are you. Every day you make constantly ch choices, right? Of what you're going to get out of bed for. If it's not the going to the gym, well, stop calling it a should. That's someone else's inject, you know? Someone else's value. Or you, you know, living in the past or in the future or something. You yourself, if you actually don't like the gym, you go, I'm not doing any, any fitness, because that's not me. I just like a little chocolate lava cake. Oh my goodness, did anyone try those today? So your shoulds and your, what you're actually doing need to be the same. I challenge you to get to that point in life. Because that's where you don't feel guilty anymore about what you're doing all day long. You're not injecting other people's values into your life. You're just doing the things you are actually believing that should be best for you. And the other one, that's interesting, right? It's actually um, the, who you want to be in 12 months' time. Do we actually think about this? Does anyone have, even ask? Ask. So do this every year, and you will be surprised how much actually you start kind of manifesting and attracting, because you're starting, and, and I always thought that was nonsense, right? For herbal people, oh, manifestation, that doesn't exist. I actually have noticed that it does. As soon as you start filtering all the noise that comes your way all day long, because you're working towards that thing, the second last line there, it starts coming to you. You start removing the stuff that's not on the way, you know, that's in the way. So it, it kind of seems to work. Next slide. All right, next tip. Find your industry or specialization or personality, whatever it is, the color you have, the clothes you wear, whatever it is. Find the niche that you are, who you are. Actually, what makes you different? So I am female, I am Dutch, I am blonde, I say rude things, I just happen to not remember a lot of technical stuff. That's my set, you know, my weird set. For you, it might be something different. You might be a real gung-ho, technical, focused person, you know, you love delving into the detail. I'm a generalist, you might be a specialist. What's your niche? What are you really uniquely good at? What do you see you're actually kind of weirdly better at than other people around you? And you're usually better at it because you love doing it. Yeah, so it's find that little niche. Could be industry, could be specific clients you like to work with. Some people love working with the not-for-profit profit sector, with small businesses, or with the big business, big end of town. That's uniquely you. Who do you feel you should be serving? What sort of clients you like to work with? If you're a consultant, you know, you like to help people from scratch to level one, or you like, you know, being intellectually challenged all day long with dealing with the, the, the clients that are very mature already. What geography? You saw some places that I've traveled with. I love new places, you know. Other people love being home because that's where the dog is. They want to work down the road. Done, you know. Nobody has to be different from who they want to be, right? And think about, actually, what can you give those clients or those organizations or people that you deal with. I've um, <laughs> quite a lot of times have been plagiarized, right? Like I, I was presenting stuff and then a week later I see some other person <laughs> presenting the same slides. I started getting really angry about that. Uh, and then I wrote, worked out to protect that stuff is pretty much impossible. And I started using it, feeling it, seeing it as flattery. I thanked the person and said, oh great, you love my slides so much, you know? The person was like, what do you mean? 
<laughs> you know? But, but you can see things in a different way. It's all your choice, how you see the stuff that comes your way, right? Some people then spend months of court cases and energy, and I just didn't find that the useful way of spending energy. But sharing things for free is actually one of the most amazing things to do, and we have so many networks where we can do that, right? And that's where people start seeing, hey, this person knows what they're talking about, but they're also a willing, giving person. And, well, eventually people will come to you for more. I started training people thinking, oh, but then they don't need me anymore if I train them all to do this work, right? I actually found they called me more because the big projects came and they go, oh, well, we now really need you. You're the trainer, right? You're almost by default by getting up on that stage like a lot of you guys do. You all already become twice as intelligent by the sheer, the sheer fact you're getting up there because people think, oh, you must know everything. You know? And I've also noticed if you really study the best three people that, that know something about a field, you study their work, their material, you can actually very quickly become super expert on something because nobody goes into that niche, right, that zooms into that particular area. So it's not that difficult to achieve. All right. Um, Next slide, mentors and trusted peers. I mean, finding people around us that we all do in this conference, for example, or in the, the PCB network, on the LinkedIn groups, of course. I've also noticed people tend to think, oh, I will um, I'll put myself forward as a mentor, because I'm being asked for that, right? First, be a mentee or a mentor before you do the opposite role. You need to know what it feels like at the receiving end. So I started actually mentoring first before I found the guts to actually ask someone else to be my mentor. Because before that, I actually thought I'll be a pain, a pain in, the, in the backside to that mentor, right? Like if I turn up there with my questions and stuff, they're busy people. But when I started mentoring someone else, I started seeing how much fun it was. And actually, ah, I felt a lot more confidence to then ask someone else. So you sometimes have, you have to put yourself in opposite shoes to be able to do anything. And to sometimes the opposite shoes are actually easier to do. So. All right, um, you can see here, so where, where to find, I mean, perfect strangers, of course, you know, uh, put yourself in, in the other person's shoes, we, we talked about that. Be someone who is fun to mentor. Think about what the other person is after. If they're after having a coffee at 3 o'clock in the afternoon of some days, go and do your mentor meetings then, you know. Don't be a, a, a difficult person. Next slide. Um, the tip number four is how to meet new customers. If you're a consultant or trainer or a freelancer or something, it's always difficult, right? People go, how, how do I profile myself? Well, that guru status is really important. We talked about that. Delivering real value, but paying it forward. We talked about do it publicly, LinkedIn, etc. but also for that customer. I've done a lot of work for customers initially where they went, what, you're doing all of this? What is this costing me? I said, oh, this part, take it. See if it works for you. If it doesn't, I actually don't think we should be working together. I don't actually, I don't need the project if it's not working for you, if I'm not the right consultant for you. But I've, get, I've got given already like a half a day or a day of what worth of work to them, you know, in some way, because I wanted to find out, are we a good match? Does that make sense? A lot of people start charging from the first moment. It's like, well, then they can't test you. So sometimes you do it that way. And never get desperate, yeah. Never be that person who really needs that customer. I've had more positive feedback from people after I'd passed on projects to other people that I knew could do a better job than me at something. And I actually managed to do it pretty much most of the time without any of that commission type stuff or anything because that feels a bit, I don't know, it doesn't feel quite right to me. I'm not saying it should be wrong to other people or anything. I'm just saying for me, if I pass a client onto another a contact that I have, it actually feels right to me that they get the best out of that and that it's purely because I think it's the best person for them, you know? And that's not 100% of the time maybe applicable, but you can often actually, yeah, you can apply it. You know, I've had contacts in this room even where I said, oh, actually, you should contact that person. I know they're the, they're the hero at it. Do that. Cl clients will value it. And especially if you think it's not going to be something that makes you happy to do, eventually, yeah, it's not really what you want to end up doing. All right, um, next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, this is really important. When people start charging, um, yeah, the first jobs I didn't have the courage either to charge a lot of money because oh, well, these people don't even know that I haven't done this stuff before, you know? But eventually, you start thinking, hey, if I don't value myself, nobody's going to value me more than what I value myself, right? 
that it just vibes off you. So it's super important that you do. And uh, think about also what the outcome is of your work. If that's something that's worth something to a certain party, it doesn't have to be the same as it is to another party. So my pricing, for example, is very personalized. If I deal with an NFP, you know, not-for-profit organization or whatever, if, if I know their budget is small, it's still my choice to still do the work. And if another client thinks, oh, you're doing it so cheap for the other party, well, they can come and have a conversation with me because I have my own reasons why I do that. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't have to be all hourly rate. I never do hourly rate type proposals at all because I take the risk of if it takes more time anyway. You know, I don't want that client to be uh, subject to the risk of me not doing the work efficiently. And they actually, they should not even be asking me how I do that work. How many hours with how many people and from what locations and I'm the expert at that. They shouldn't be telling me that. You know when you do tender responses and there's all this stuff in there about how many days and hours and whatever you should be spending. I, I cannot believe that honestly. Because I know how it works for the work that I deliver, right? And sometimes it takes less, sometimes more, but I take the risk if it takes more time too. So that's another uh, thing that I apply. Yeah, next one. Conducting your work profitably and at low risk or overhead. I mean, what I do um, in terms of uh, intellectual property, I developed uh, a number of things that can be replicated for different organizations. Like I said, the legal protection of it can be very difficult, and so I tend to not really do that. But it tends to be so visible that customers actually know that, hey, I, I'm not going to send this to other people. I want everyone to pay the, the, the reasonable fees for this, right? So I used a lot of that in my um, previous sort of uh, development stages of, of my business as well. Another thing I found very important is as soon as you start getting a little bit bigger, uh, being uh, Rinske Geerlings in my case, uh, eventually that's not a sellable business. It's not scalable. It's not, yeah, it, it, for me it needs to be my brand called business as usual in this case, right? And that's, that's important because then you can start building your network and actually training others to do things in the ethical way that you do them and become more, well, servicing more people. And so that's also important that you don't think, oh, I'm going to stay small forever. Think big in that 12-month line that you wrote down. Think something that is beyond you, you know? Um, divide and exchange fairly. Um, recently, I read a book, and it says, basically, if you have a project, uh, a consultancy project, for example, a third should go to the sale, a third to the intellectual property, and a third to the delivery. And whoever's involved in any of those thirds should get the, the, the reasonable part of that. Very interesting philosophy, because a lot of freelance people, consultants, they think, oh, I'll be earning 80, 90% of that fee, and then there's a bit for the person who sold the, the thing. You know? But that sort of thing, you, the history of what you build as a business and as an ethically sound entity for people to deal with, and all the things you shared for free in the past, and all the pre-sale activities, there are a huge amount of financial and, and time investment, right? And some of you know this. But they're often not translated once you're up and running into the returns. So that's another concept I'm really interested in to, to consider, right? All right. Um, yeah, I mentioned the, the, the passionate people that you subcontract to. People who become the face of your business don't think just about their skills. Think about their ethical values. Think about what they stand for as a person, how you resonate with them. Are they going to have fun with this? Like I said, what do they get up for in the morning? It needs to resonate with them. Next slide. This is another thing I do with organizations. When I deliver something at the end, I actually always offer three months later to come back and to talk about, has this worked for you? Is this something that created value? A lot of people, they do the project, they run away, they think, oh, thank goodness, that's done. You know? But I actually think the follow-up is the most important because what you build there if you walk out the door, the most important thing, you created some form of transformation. Could be very small, could be huge, but it needs to be something that they have taken on as a, a little part of their DNA. And we're often too scared to ask three months later, oh, is it still working for you, you know? And that's one of the key things, how you keep yourself um, sound as well. And what it does in the end is they go, oh yeah, ah, oh, here you are, you're back here. By the way, we've got this other stuff. Have you ever done any of that stuff? Do you know what I'm talking about? Some of you who are doing this, you get more work. Because if they're happy, they want to give more to you. Most, of, most people in this room that I speak to, they think, oh, if I submit a proposal to an organization, it's some entity that's going to assess it, right? 
I talked, I had a few conversations yesterday about tendering, and we think it ends up in some department of some organization. That bunch of, that department is a bunch of people. And people eventually want to give their money to people they like. Yeah, an organization is just a group of people. So if, the, if you have a good relationship with them, they will try to give you more work. They're just humans. We all do this, right? You try to give your money to a, a nice uh, restaurant down the road where you know the owner, etc. They do a good job. Same for what you're doing with consultancy. Yeah. This is a super important one, and that is if you don't make it measurable what you actually try to achieve, you can't celebrate your success. I see people running behind the facts all the time. They get worn out and tired, and they go, oh, I've had this really busy year, and oh, I've got all this stuff that I didn't do yet because I was so behind, and I'm working 80 hours a day. And they never get to stop and say, let's look back at these 12 months. So I challenge you all on the 5th of October 2024, when we're all back in a huge, beautiful location in the, in the planet, that you all look back and go, can I celebrate with a glass of wine what I've done in the last 12 months? You know, because we're all focusing on the what I should be doing, what I should have done, but not actually what I have done. Super important. Give back to something close to your heart. I mean, this is something where I actually have a philosophy. When you start making profit as a business or a consultancy, Think about a little percentage, whatever it is, and give that to not just a charity out there. Think about what that charity stands for. For me, I love music as a hobby, right? So I share that, that, that profit with an organization that teaches kids piano and singing, whatever, out in the back of uh, organ you know, countries that don't even have schools. And I see it, I feel it, you know? I feel that I'm part of the DNA of that organization. So that becomes part of my little mission to be a profitable little entity is, hey, I'm actually helping other people. And not just people that I don't know through some bureaucratic system. No, actually a bunch of people that I really relate to in my heart, you know? So that's, I think, super important as well. So when the voice and vision on the inside is louder and more profound than all the opinions on the outside, you've begun to master your life. That's a, uh, a line from Dr. John Martini. It's one of the gurus that I think are really guiding for me. It's really about staying on track, on mission, and don't let anything stop you. It's sometimes actually really important to see if something didn't go right, I lost a client, or I didn't get the certification, or something... What is actually the benefit in there? Ask as soon as you can. I do this with all life events now. Anything that, that doesn't go your way, you think, oh, I lost something, or oh, I didn't get that money for my house, or whatever. Think later, what did it give me? Or think it immediately, if possible. There's always a silver lining. It's hidden in there somewhere, but nobody asks the question. A lot of the world is based on victim mentality, right? We all go the poor you, poor me kind of thing think, what was, what was this good for? Yeah, and I've seen people who were in horrible places, in war zones and all sorts of stuff. I had a guy in training the other day. He drove his family out of Ukraine the other day. This guy has now been given 50 opportunities to be a cybersecurity student, all sorts of stuff, because of his story. You know? And just because he's honest about sharing it, people just want to help someone. And this guy's smart. Like, he's flying. You think this guy asked himself the question tomorrow, going, what was the benefit in that, that Russia war? It's there. Yeah, be, be honest about what you can actually achieve, you know, and what you can actually value. So there's a lot of words from, uh, from my side. Um, I wanted to ask anyone if, if you want to share a story, something inspiring, if you have anything there, or if you want to spend some more time on the exercises that I uh, suggested you do today. And otherwise, yeah, any other feedback or, uh, or questions? <laughs> Thanks. Michael? I just want to thank you very much. Um, going through this, I feel phenomenal. I happen to have an incredible, incredible, incredible year. And all the things I'm grateful for were popping up. And I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And I'm just sitting here saying, I have to thank her for helping me um, be so excited about my last year. It's been an absolutely dream. And I just want to thank you for helping me relive those moments. So thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. You're one of the people I was thinking about in my, in my talk because I know how hard you work and I know how easy it is not to ask that question, to say, what did I actually achieve? Let me stop and smell the roses for a moment. It's true, man. Yeah. Well, there you go.
Uh huh, uh huh. And, and do it, make it a long list for that year, you know? What am I proud of? What, what did I achieve? The dimensions you can use are not just work, right? They're personal, they're, you know, spiritually. What did you get to physically? Did you, you know, make changes? So, yeah, I, I love hearing this, yeah? Uh, I, I was really feeling that it was me speaking. Uh, I mean, it's really inspiring. You know, I, bid, uh, I was starting my journey 10 years ago as a doing an NGO training on the starting. And right now I've been in marketplace for experts. And we're trying to do what you're doing, giving the uh, best way to our expert to be branded, to be proud of what they're doing and to have the skills so what, that's why we partner with PCB. So I would love to have you in one of our internal community webinar um, from our marketplace of Expert Africa. We have more than 100 experts, and I think they would love to hear you. Thank you so much. What's your name? Omar. Omar. Omar, the next step up is once you've internalized and integrated all of the stuff that you just said about the challenges you had the last 10 years, you worked so hard, actually share that story. Share that story. People love reading what people have achieved from zero to up. I'm not saying zero, but you know what I mean. You, you describe it as that was a big journey. People love hearing those big journeys, you know? Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah? Um, one part that, that interested me was the tip on the seven on eight about the follow-up. I want to ask um, Pepper Lena advice. Because of the demand with clients, I mean, you have um, targets. How do you manage the follow-up with new clients? And then second question is that, um, is it nice to put a charge to it or give it as a, um, a, um, a bonus? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, look, I give it as a bonus because then clients, otherwise a customer goes, oh, look, that follow-up thing, we don't really need that. And then I lost the opportunity. So I add it as a complimentary uh, follow-up session. And then it becomes completely expected for them to get that call three months later from me and saying, hey, how's it going? Shall we have a quick catch-up, you know, Zoom call or something? And so it's a, it's a natural thing that they will expect. Yeah, I, would, I don't charge for it because for that reason. I don't want them to say no thanks, you know? How do you manage the demand? How do you manage the demand? New clients and then ongoing clients? Yeah, yeah, big challenge. Uh, the type of work that I chose to do, the mix that I've created of the services that I provide, uh, all have some that are more urgent, typically, for a client, and others that can usually wait for a client. So, for example, I do a lot of risk appetite workshops with boards and executives. Board meeting frequencies are usually once a six months, once every three months, once every 12 months. So typically that work has quite long lead times if I wanted to have long lead times. Does that make sense? Those things are more long term. I do some other work which is more instant, like, oh, we need a BCP rehearsal because of the regulator every year we need to do it. I know when those you know, frequencies are and I know that that creates more immediate pressure. So that's why I don't spend more of my scope of services than about maybe 20 or 30 percent on that work because I know it creates too much stress, you know, on the same day, too many, too many questions. And then the other work spread out a little bit. Does that sort of answer your question? Just think strategically about that. It's the same as small and big clients, right? Like dealing with big organizations seems like a dream, right? Oh, wow, we've got this huge contract. Immediately ask the question, what's the downside in that? You remember I said, what's the flip side, the positive? Ask also when you start getting elated about something, think, Ah, what's the potential downside here? Let's, let's just get neutral here, right? Everything's neutral until someone judges it. If it's purely financial, you might think it's great, but dependency on one organization is not a good thing, you know, for 80% of your income. But also the pressure and the control they start getting over your internal processes could be huge. Depends on the customer. That's why I really pick those customers, and I often say no to that work if I don't really want that situation. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, thank you very much. My name is um, Ebifa. I'm from the National Oil Company of Nigeria. Um, I wanted to thank you because all what you just said was practically what um, 
my manager was discussing with me before I traveled down to Paris. Um, it was just about, I still want to tie it to a question. Um, last year, I worked very hard gaining a lot of certifications and doing some process improvements in the company. Um, this year, I said, okay, let me get to relax because I finished a three months training um, in the UK and I wanted to relax. But uh, last week, he called me and said, uh, your profile is dropping, you know? So I just wanted to ask. I think it was part of celebrating success. Let me just relax and maybe come back better next, maybe in January and all that. So I just want to ask, like, after attaining a limit of success, at what point do you come and say, okay, let's do this again? Maybe from your own personal stories. I see you have gotten a lot of certifications and a lot of additions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, merci. Um, look, I think it's all um, a mix of different things that you do in life. Certif I, I see people getting completely obsessed with certification. I have nothing against certification. I do it. I love training too. You know, I get that, like the two two three six one and the three three two two three one six and all these things I've been doing in the last few years. But I'm also very mindful of the application of it in between is super important because integrating the actual knowledge with just theoretical kind of information is uh, not going to get you that far. Sometimes even gives you more confusions, you know, if you haven't really applied it. So I think there needs to be a longer term vision on your training as well. Like when you go, I mentioned three to five years, right? You go, hey, in the next three to five years, these are the kind of milestones I want to achieve. I might do foundation now for a couple of things. In three years, I might actually do lead implementer type things and actually find at least two projects to apply those things. And then I'll do the next level up, master or whatever, you know. And that's why that skills uh, initiative is so important because it's continuous learning. The PCB skills um, site, you know, where there's snippets of 15 minutes to refresh your practical knowledge. I think it's a great idea. Because I see a lot of people really, uh, yeah, taking certification very serious, and it takes a long time to study sometimes. But yeah, does that take you away from the ap the practical application? You know. So hopefully that gives you a little guidance. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Sharings. I really invite you to take those questions again and and write them in your own time a little bit more. So just like what Michael's saying, actually writing down a long list of what have what have I actually achieved in the last 12 months. That question alone, you know, if that makes you feeling different about this day, um, yeah, please, please do it, yeah? Oh, great to have all of you here, and uh, thanks PCB for organizing.